Thanks, Logan. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for coming and to the talk and to the concert. Um, we are, this would be our seventh concert in the tour, but um, for reasons that are obvious, we, we didn't perform this show in Napier because of what's been happening there. So this is our sixth performance and uh, Michael and I have found a really great rhythm at this point. Um, I've, I've been thinking about what would be really good to share with you before a performance, like what is a pre-concert talk good for? And um, you have, uh, if, you, if you have, uh, a program, a really good program that has really great information in it about the pieces. And so what I thought I might share is maybe a little bit more background, um, a little bit more about the, um, I suppose, the motivation you know, in the pieces and what kind of experience you're going to have tonight. Because it is different from what you might expect from a chamber music concert. Um, first and foremost, um, it's obviously a piano recital, and we have uh, one of, if not the best um, proponent of the instrument in this country playing tonight, and uh, is playing a lot, lots and lots of notes, uh, which I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about. Uh, th that's one aspect of a th kind of three-dimensional experience. The other thing that's happening is there is a kind of cinematic, almost audio soundtrack that goes with the um, what Michael is playing, and then there is a, a video, there is film, there is visual content, so you get all three of these things happening. Um, and it, you're actually in for a very intense experience because the first half of the program is a new piece just launched on this tour called Secondhand Time. And uh, that's, a, that's the title of a book by Russian authoress Svetlana Alexeyevich. And Secondhand Time is an extraordinary read it's a series of interviews, a long, big, thick book of interviews with uh, Russian people uh, spanning a very long period of history. And they talk about, each of them, their experience of time in Russia. It might be from the 50s, the 60s, 70s, the 80s, right up to today. But what's extraordinary about the book is that Svetlana takes, everybody speaks in the first person singular, so everybody goes, I this or I that. What she does is she merges all of these people into one person. So there's one I that tells all of these stories and it's the most incredible experience. So I, I, I stole the title from the book and used it for this piece, Secondhand Time. And this piece, whatever money you've paid for your ticket, half of it has gone towards a very intense reading experience, which you're about to have. Um, this piece, uh, what it does is, uh, it's, it, for me it's a new thing, it combines very tightly controlled rhythmic delivery of text in small bursts that add up to sentences or paragraphs as you're reading. It combines that with virtuosic, highly virtuosic piano performance and very emotionalized musical environments. So these three things come together and they have a certain impact. And I, I think that I sort of, I've stumbled accidentally uh, onto something that's really strong. I think it's very powerful. I mean, you'll be the judge of it you'll have your experience, and I'm very interested to know what it's like for people, because it's new. I know what it's like for me. The text itself has come from uh, a series of books, well, a group of books that I read over quite a long time, six or seven years. Uh, and I didn't actually read that many books in that time because they're incredibly difficult books to read. Uh, I started reading, one was called um, the, the Violence of Organized Forgetting, The Rise of the American Disimagination Machine. So that's a hell of a title and tells you what uh, kind of level of uh, concept the book is, is aimed at. So I started reading this book years ago and uh, everything I read I thought, this is extraordinary, it's so important. And I would, I would tell my kids, you've you got to hear this, you've got to know what this is. But the thing is, it's written by an academic 
And so I, I don't really have that brain, and it's really hard work. So I would be reading over and over and over again, go through a whole page and realise none of it had gone in, and go back and read it again because I sensed it was very valuable. So over the course of these five or six years, I read maybe a dozen of these sorts of books, and they're by writers, once again, it's all in the programme. Uh, Henry Giroux is one, he's American who teaches in, in Canada, Brad Evans who's in the UK, and they both, for, for example, they're both featured on Russell Brand's podcast or video cast, so they're, on, they're, they're kind of in that sort of world as well. They write about a lot of things, such as what is happening to education, what is our relationship to violence, especially in the form of entertainment, uh, what is happening to social spaces in the world, because we're actually, I mean, it's obvious we're losing so many social spaces where we can gather and talk and discuss and share and explore thoughts and ideas. Th these sorts of things. Um, I made my way through a whole lot of their books. I, I was marking stuff as I went, what I think of as the nuggets, you know, within all of this. Um, and I got to a point where I just felt I really want other people, I think everybody should read these books, but no one I know is going to read these books. That's what it felt like. And I wanted in some way to proliferate or disseminate the content in some way. And so I, I took the step uh, of contacting these authors and I wrote to them. And they both, in, at separate times, they both replied within an hour. And they were in different time zones, so I, I don't know where they were or when they were. But they wrote, they wrote back within an hour and they both said the same thing. Take it, use it, spread it. And they got in touch with their publishers and their publishers sent me PDFs so I could copy more easily from the content. And so what I did was I extracted from these, these um, books what I think of as nuggets. And I put them onto cards in a piece of software, like, you know, uh, uh, little text cards. And I printed them out. And I, once I printed them out, I counted them. And I had 2,000 of these cards. And I actually had to enlist my wife and my daughter to help me cut them out. And it took three days just to cut the cards out. So it's quite a big undertaking. And then I had really big tables, and I just put all these cards out. And I have to say that throughout this whole journey, I, I've never known where any of it was going. I didn't know it would end up with this, where we are now. I just knew that I was compelled to explore and to see where this might take me. And uh, I had these cards all out, and I started grouping them together and taking cards from other books and putting them with other cards and just following a kind of instinct. And then themes started to emerge. And I ended up with four very powerful themes, and two of them have been turned into pieces. The other two I'll do one day, but the two that have been turned into pieces are what you'll hear. And the first one of these, which is what opens the concert, is called The Nature of Reality, because something that's explored by these authors and by a great documentary maker, Adam Curtis, is this question. How does or anyone, any of us, how do we arrive at a point where we go, I'm sure this is real? Like, this is reality. Because we all, I think, especially in today's world with the way information moves around, is transformed, is polluted, you know, the way it's changed, um, we have very different ways of arriving at what is real and we arrive at very different intensities of belief in what is real. So that's the nature of reality, and you'll, you'll see within that this text that's talking about technology, the impact on, on us, um, the impact on critical thinking, you know, these are all sort of very heady and important ideas. The second piece uh, is called The Aesthetics of Violence, and that really dives into the fact that the greatest earner in all entertainment now is violence, like by a long shot. We consume so much of it. We're so used to it now. And there's a line in um, that that you'll see on the screen. Uh, having spoken to people afterwards, they said they, they felt a twinge of guilt when they read this line, which is, it's a little build-up of text that says, um, torture now appears in mainstream entertainment from action films 
to dramas, and then there's a little pause, and it goes at the end, it goes to comedies, you know, and this is a thing. It's, we've, re we've reached that point now. So that's what that movement um, is focused on. So you get these two. The other two, which I haven't written, which I, I really would like to one day, uh, one is about um, equality and distribution of wealth, and the idea that more and more segments of population are, become, are being considered disposable, so this idea of disposable futures. And then the last one, because this is all pretty dark so far, right? The last one is to do with uh, radical imagination and what sort of things might we come up with that would lead us forward in some way to something better. So that's that piece. Now, in the creation of this piece, uh, I've had quite a lot of um, input, I would say, from others. And I'm going to embarrass a few people tonight that I can see are here who have had something to do with the creation of this work and the next one. Um, I'm just thinking about how to do it. So uh, one of the great things about both of these projects is I've been able to engage with and collaborate with younger artists. And when you get to my ripe old age, it's actually it's an amazing uh, energizer to be able to do so. So, uh, in secondhand time, uh, helping me with the text and putting together the movies that you'll see which have all this text coming out, I had a very good friend, ex-student as well, but uh, a person that's helped me a huge amount in my recent journey as a composer, and he's here, it's King and Shanky, I'll just introduce him. Have it stand up, just say, come on, please. <laughs> and, thank you. Yeah, uh, it's always a little bit awkward doing this, but, but I, I think it's really important because everyone's here. Um, also in secondhand time, in the second piece, the violence piece, there is a, an amazing beat that goes through it for the first three, oh, I don't know, five or six minutes. And it's multi-layered, it's super exciting, incredibly energized. And I asked the composer of that beat if I could use it. And he said, absolutely, take it, use it. I mean, not a lot of choice because it was my son. And I'd like to introduce him here. This is Emmanuel Psathas, very, very talented young producer and composer. Have, have, stand up, man. <laughs> <laughs> it was an extraordinary experience putting this music together, knowing that the music that I was building above was written by my, my own son. Um, and in the last part of that piece, there is a very violent bit of percussion music that enters. You won't miss it. And that was written also by an incredibly talented ex-student of mine who's in Taiwan at the moment, Emmanuel, it with an I, Emmanuel Danimbring. And he's not here, but um, it's an extraordinary piece of sonic rhythm that he created. So that's secondhand time. So the second half of the concert is uh, a piece called Voices at the End, which uh, is a very long journey, like five or six years this, this piece has been going, originally composed for six pianos, six grand pianos, because it, it was asked for by a group in the UK called Piano Circus. And Piano Circus are amazing. I mean, they're, they're the best group I've ever been drinking with, I have to say, really, really great company. And um, they asked me for this piece and I said yes, wildly impractical decision because when do you ever get six grand pianos together? Just the tuning was really expensive. And so uh, I wrote this piece, but it didn't really get played over there too hard to put on a whole performance. And I was very lucky that two years ago the Auckland Festival premiered it and there was a fantastic performance there with six of our finest and multi-generations within the group of pianists playing. It was extraordinary and Michael was one of them as well. afterwards 
that's never going to happen again. So I have this great piece. I thought I think it's a great piece, but it, it'll it won't have a life. So I, what I did was create a solo piano version of it, and we have Michael playing about 60 to 70 percent of all six parts. Right, they've been collapsed down into this amazing solo virtuosic part. Um, and the other bits and pieces that are left over are pre-recorded and they're on the back of track. So I just want to tell you a bit about the, the, the genesis of that piece, which is, there's a movie which I very strongly recommend if you haven't seen it, called Planetary. And it's a documentary, and um, it's really about uh, us as a, as a planetary species, like one, one group. Uh, and it starts with these beautiful descriptions by astronauts that have been on the space station talking about looking down. And, you know, you read about this. Uh, they have this incredible... Um, moment where they realize that we are basically one one group of people and they say this great thing which is you just can't see the borders when you're looking down on the planet it's kind of an incredible idea um, it, it, within this film one of the women that speaks Joanna Macy she she describes this thing and it really struck me and it basically inspired this this piece voices at the end she talks about the idea of narrative like the story that is unfolding at the moment that is our story as a, as a species of animal on planet Earth. And she says that we, we are writing that story. No one's writing it for us. We're actually the, the, the authors of the narrative of our future. But she said that at this point in history, we have really three dominant choices of narrative that we could choose from. And the first of them is business as usual, which is we just do what we do. We keep doing. We keep growing. We keep consuming, which equals, you know, destroying and burning and so on. You know, we just keep doing what we're doing because we are really good at it. So that's business as usual. I, I haven't yet found somebody, when I say what the three choices are, that has said that first one is the best one. But it's there. It's definitely an option. The second one is unravelling, which is the idea that it's what scientists do. Uh, you lift up the carpet and you look underneath and you see what, what it is that's coming from what we're doing, like what's happening I mean, a really good example is that ecosystems shred, right? They're shredding all over the world at the moment, including many of our own. Um, and then the third is, is a more positive idea. It's called the great turning. And this isn't a kind of uh, Disney optimism about the future. It's really this idea that, that a massive evolutionary pressure that has pushed us from behind and that has given us so many tools and solutions uh, to survive so far. This evolutionary pressure to survive. That that may kick in strongly enough and, and change our behavior. So these are the three narratives, and they are the three main parts of this piece, Voices at the End. And there's a prologue, which sets it up, and there's an epilogue, which takes it out. So it's five parts. The thing is, it has a movie that goes with it. And I'll just tell you, a difference between the two films is that in the first piece, you have to stare at the screen. Michael is totally reconciled to not being looked at in that first piece because you won't have time. You'll just be reading and absorbing, and it's a very intense bit of reading. The second piece, though, it's a kind of luxurious, very colourful, rich film that uh, is slow, and so you have this nice counterpoint between the two. So you can look at Michael, you can look at the screen, you can move between things. So in Voices at the End, there are just two people also that I want to acknowledge. Uh, in the third part, Unraveling, which is the middle movement. There's a, there's a beautiful Armenian song. It's a, absolutely tragic, sad love song. And I had a lot of help from a couple of Armenian friends to um, translate it, you know, and get it, get, like, be really clear on what was being said. And then I, I spoke to a, an ex-student of mine, a good friend, Briar Prestidi, who's here, who came and sang it. And you'll, it's, it's, Amazing to have, I think, the first time ever, Briar in the room listening to her own singing during this thing. So have, stand up, Briar, and let, let us see you. 
Um, and I had a real pleasure in Tauranga of, we were doing this show and Bri's parents came to it and it was a very beautiful experience. And then um, the last person I want to acknowledge is somebody that's been with me on this journey from university days and has helped me and enhanced a whole lot of work that I've done in so many ways with immense generosity and extraordinary musicality. And this is my friend David. Um, David um, took a whole lot of things that were in this piece, like rhythms and sounds, and reworked them, re-recorded them, did things to them, which he says was no big deal, but in fact they really elevated the work, came up with all kinds of sounds that I used in it, and um, really just kind of transformed it into something way, way better than it was. So I want to acknowledge David Downs, who's an amazing composer in his own right. <laughs> Thank you. So that's the two pieces. What I want to say also is something about Michael. And the, what I love saying about Michael is that he spent the last five years utterly failing to retire, <laughs> which I'm very grateful for. Um, and we have had the most fantastic um, journey so far. It's been really, really special touring with him because I met Michael when I was at very early stages in high school turning pages for my sister in a master class that he was taking. So it's a really amazing experience to be with him here now. And the other thing is that if you know Michael or anything about him, generally people think Beethoven, you know, that kind of music. But he's been doing a lot of work with Roger Fox, doing all of this jazz playing. And you'll see in this, it's very different from probably anything else you've ever heard him do as well. And what's extraordinary is he just celebrated his 70th birthday. He can step into these environments that are you know, 40, 50 years younger in terms of the sound world and just nail it. It's fantastic, really great. You're in for a real treat with his playing. All right, well, please, please enjoy the show and um, I, I commend to you the most incredible pianist I've worked with, which is Michael Houston. Thank you very much. Thank you.